Welcome to the 700 Club. Palestinian leaders are now reveling in their new relationship with the White House. In stark contrast to the policies of former President Trump, President Biden is now promising the Palestinians to, number one, refund the U.N. Agency for Palestinian Refugees, reopen a U.S. consulate for Palestinian affairs, and restore funding to the Palestinian Authority. Well, the administration is also providing $450 million to the Palestinian Authority. So how are the Israelis responding to this? And what could be the long-term repercussions? Chris Mitchell reports from Ramallah. Palestinian Authority Prime Minister Mohammed Staye wants the world to know he's satisfied so far with what he's hearing from Washington. Our relationship with the new American administration has been going very well based on the promises that were made by the Biden administration. We think that this administration is a real departure from where we were with President Trump. Steye says those specific promises include restoring funding to UNRWA, maintaining the status quo agreement on the Temple Mount where only Muslims are allowed to pray, opposing Israeli construction in Judea and Samaria, which is also referred to as the West Bank. The State Department told CBN News in a statement the U.S. does support the status quo agreement on the Temple Mount, opposes unilateral steps that undercut negotiations like settlement construction in the West Bank, and is currently providing $450 million to the Palestinian Authority, some of which is pledged to UNRWA. Perhaps the biggest public nod from the Biden administration came early this year when Secretary of State Antony Blinken indicated the U.S. would reopen its consulate to the Palestinian Authority in Jerusalem. That promise met stiff resistance from Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. Foreign Minister Yair Lapid suggested the PA use Ramallah as an alternate location. Prime Minister Steyer made it clear that the Palestinian Authority doesn't want the U.S. consulate here in Ramallah, but only in Jerusalem. Ramallah is not Jerusalem. And Ramallah is not the capital of Palestine. We want this consulate in Jerusalem to be the future American embassy to the state of Palestine. This conversation brings into question a divided Jerusalem, which Palestinians want as part of a so-called two-state solution. Israeli leaders maintain the city is their capital and will remain unified. Former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Danny Ayalon says reopening the U.S. consulate to the Palestinians would jeopardize relations with Israel and endanger the Jewish state's fragile new government. I think that could really wreak havoc within this uh, uh, government. Uh, there's no way uh, politically that Bennett could agree to that. The opposition, which is still headed by Bibi Netanyahu, would uh, have a heyday, and that could spark a large demonstrations. Ayalon says the consulate dilemma puts the U.S. in an untenable situation, with promises to the PA on the one hand and violating Israeli sovereignty on the other. Well, Chris Mitchell is with us for more on this. Um, I mean, it's a startling change in policy. It looks like the Biden administration has backed itself into a corner of the consulate. Is there, is there any way out for them? Well, going it really will be very difficult, and it puts them in the proverbial between a rock and a hard place. Some have put it, you know, they're trying to square the circle. It's going to be very hard. So you have the Palestinian Authority on one hand. They're actually depending on that promise to reestablish the consulate. And as they said, as the prime minister said, they really see it as the future embassy for the state of Palestine. It's really reviving their dreams of a state of Palestine. On the other hand, you have this is going to violate Israelis' sovereignty. And Ambassador Ayalon was telling us, as well in that interview that it really could cause the uh, Bennett government to collapse if he allows us. And uh, it also, uh, Gordon, it puts Jerusalem back in the middle of the Israeli-Palestinian issue. I'm not sure that's where the Biden administration wanted to put it. Uh, demonstrations are already planned to oppose this move uh, here in Jerusalem, and it's really a, a potentially explosive situation, especially when you're talking about the city of Jerusalem. It's amazing to me that they would stumble so badly that they wouldn't recognize the 1963 Geneva Accord on consulates. Israel has an absolute right to decline this. Uh, if if we, we, we press them, we're in violation of in international law. I just don't understand how they could make such a blunder. 
Well, it's, uh, you know, some people would say they've made a number of blunders right now. I mean, if you look at the uh, pullout of Afghanistan, uh, but actually back in May when Antony Blinken made this promise, uh, you know, uh, Ambassador Ayalan was telling us, you know, they didn't really foresee exactly what uh, this would lead to, what problems it would lead to b between both the Palestinians uh, and the Israelis. It does seem like an unforced error, but I think when they came in uh, to this administration, they wanted to reverse almost everything the Trump administration wanted to do. They really can't probably move the embassy back from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, but this is something they felt they could do to, to reopen this consulate. It, but as we see, it has many ramifications they likely did not anticipate. Well, they can't move the embassy. That's a violation of U.S. law. Uh, they would have to pass a law repealing that. Uh, and uh, I know a lot of uh, senators would get really upset if they even, even attempted it. Here, here's the interesting thing to me, and, and this is what the Palestinian prime minister was talking about yesterday. And he seems to be specifically directing this to the foreign press. He's speaking in English. He's speaking to the foreign press. And he's giving us a different view on uh, a Palestinian state. It's something brand new that I haven't heard from the Palestinians before. Uh, describe that for us. Well, when you're uh, there in the press conference, uh, Gordon, you're actually listening to a whole different uh, point of view that you hear here in Israel. Uh, first of all, he criticized uh, Prime Minister Bennett that Bennett had three no's, no to negotiations, no to meeting with the boss, and no to a Palestinian state. Uh, now, in his, as he's talking to the, uh, to the foreign press, and if you didn't have any sort of history or, or about what's going on in the region, Gordon, you, you, you really would, uh, as a uh, believe a lot of things he was saying. He was saying Israel's illegally occupying Jerusalem. He's saying all communities in Judea and Samaria are illegal. He was telling Israel is an occupying power, an apartheid state. We asked two questions, Gordon. We asked, first of all, about funding Palestinians that are convicted of terror crimes against Israelis. He defended that. He said they had to be responsible. And we also asked him, Gordon, about the death penalty for Palestinians if they sell land to Jews. I think a lot of people may not know no, that's a Palestinian law. Uh, he defended that, too, and sell, said selling land in Palestine was a political issue, not a real estate issue. And when you have all these views, it's really hard to see a way forward to resolve the situation between Israelis and Palestinians without divine intervention. Well, I, I've got to ask, uh, do, do you think their advocacy now for a two-state solution? I mean, you go back in the history, uh, they were offered two states by the UN in 1948. After the Six Day War, they were offered a state, they turned it down. Uh, there have been various attempts, whether Oslo, Camp David, you, you name it, they've, they've been offered uh, their own state, and every single time they've turned it down. Uh, you listen to the rhetoric coming from Hamas and Gaza, from the uh, Popular Front in the West Bank, and it's all drive Israel into the sea. So uh, do you believe them when they say they really do want a two-state solution? Uh, it's a great question, Gordon. If you go back to the history, like you said, back to the 1940s, perhaps even before that, uh, they have rejected a two-state solution again and again and again. Uh, and if you look at not only Hamas's rhetoric, but if you look at the rhetoric of Fatah, which is the political arm of the Palestinian Authority, uh, they say quite clearly they, they see all of Palestine as a future Palestinian state. Uh, so if you, if you listen to perhaps the prime minister yesterday and you didn't have that history, you would think, well, they do want a two-state solution. But when you look a little deeper and listen to their rhetoric, what they say in Arabic as well, it looks uh, clearly that they want a one-state solution, a one-state to replace the Jewish state. Is this another classic case where they say one thing in English uh, to the foreign press, they oh. say a completely different thing in Arabic to their own people? Uh, very much, Gordon. I think that was one of the first lessons I came here over 20 years ago. The head of memory, which is the Middle East uh, Media Research Institute, has said, listen to what is said in Arabic. And if you listen to what's said in Arabic, it's far different than what you say, you hear in English. Uh, Yasser Arafat was a master of that, saying one thing in Arabic to his people, another thing in English to the Western press and Western leaders. Uh, it, it, you got to square that circle. You have to hear what's being said in Arabic to really find out what's happening. All right, Chris, thanks for the insight.
Let me add just a little bit of history to this story, and it goes back to 2016. John Kerry made uh, a speech. He was trying to summarize his policy and the Obama administration policy in Israel. And uh, to give you the broader context, he was also saying there can be no separate peace with the Arab nations without first solving the Palestinian question. So everything that's been accomplished over the last 14 months with the Abraham Accords, with Israel coming to peace with UAE, Bahrain, these, these nations that have been historical enemies are now at peace. They're now establishing trade uh, with Israel. He was saying, that's impossible, we can't do that. So he's already been proven wrong. But here is what he said. And it's fascinating to me to hear Abbas repeat this same thing at the UN, but also their prime minister, they seem to you know, multiply these titles. There's no real government. It's not a state, but they have a prime minister. He's speaking in English, and he's talking about a two-state solution. But they're reading the playbook that John Kerry gave them. So what they're doing is mimicking, mimicking back the policy that the previous administration had. They're saying, well, we agree with you, and, and aren't the Israelis really bad? And if, and if you just continue to fund us and continue to do these things, uh, you know, we can have peace. Here's what John Kerry said. They have a choice, and he's talking about Israel. He's talking about the Jews in Israel. They can choose to live together in one state, or they can separate into two states, but here is a fundamental reality. If the choice is one state, Israel can either be Jewish or democratic. It cannot be both, and it won't ever really be at peace. That was John Kerry, December 28, 2016. And that is completely false. Israel is a democratic state. It is a Jewish state. It's a Jewish majority. But they're Arabs in the government. They're Muslims in the government. They have a vibrant democracy. It's the only nation in the Middle East where the Christian population is actually growing. They tolerate all the religions. You have freedom of religion. You have freedom of speech. You have freedom of press. You have the freedom to elect. You have freedom of assembly. You have all these wonderful freedoms. They've been a traditional ally. To put it out there that you cannot be a democracy and hold to the value that the Jewish people have a right of self-determination is absolutely false. And it ignores the reality on the ground. The reality on the ground is Palestinians teach their children on a regular basis to kill Jews. Palestinians execute other Palestinians when they sell land to Jews. Palestinians pay terrorists money monthly so that they encourage more attacks against Jews. That's the reality. We finally had an administration that stood up to it, recognized Jerusalem as the undivided capital of Israel, uh, to stop the payments to UNRWA for all this education of hate, uh, stop the payments to the Palestinian Authority because of the terrorist payments. They finally stood up for what is right, and to see all of that reversed and, and to proceed down this old path, it really makes no sense to me. So please pay attention to what they say in Arabic, because it's completely different than what they said, said yesterday in English. Well, today is Veterans Day, and we want to pay special tribute to the members of our armed forces. Sometimes overlooked are the sacrifices their families are making. That's why one Virginia artist created a unique exhibit to honor these hidden heroes. Mark Martin brings us a look at this larger-than-life photo display. It looks like a supersized class photo spread out on the front of a massive Virginia Beach furniture store. In this case, the home room includes veterans, active duty personnel, and their families across the Hampton Roads area. I've never produced a public work this large. Artist Bobby Levin calls his project Expressions of Courage. I saw this as a perfect vehicle to marry with things that I'm passionate about, a respect for the military, the veterans and the families, and my passion for public art. And that I believe it makes us, it enriches our lives and makes it for a, just a, a better community. Workers spent nine to 10 hours installing the exhibit. Levin hopes those who view it reflect on the sacrifice of military families. 
And there is a shared level of emotion and feelings that every military family goes through. And this just hopefully will raise the level of awareness of that sacrifice that those people are really making because it's real and it's significant and it needs to be acknowledged and recognized. And hopefully, this is the type of tribute that does it. Every time I look at it, I happen to see somebody else that I recognize. You know? Laura Baxter is the executive director of the Armed Services YMCA of Hampton Roads. She helped arrange time for Levin to take photos of members of the Y. He had to make a funny face or, you know, smile. Um, it's not that staunch, you know, I'm in the military, you know, I have to be strong. It's the courage comes in many forms. And when you're talking about um, the courage that a military family has to entail, I mean, they have to have that courage on the, on the front line, but then the, also the family has to too. I feel like I'm famous now. <laughs> 11-year-old Nevaeh Barnes and her mom, Ashley James, are featured among the 167 photos. Courage uh, makes you uh, stronger and it makes you step through your fears. We may not leave, um, but we're at home supporting them uh, every step of the way. So it's, it's very, you know, I'm just grateful for the recognition. You know, we feel seen today, so that's really awesome. <laughs> Nevaeh's dad, Marquise James, hopes the exhibit sends an important message. Just the fact that there's more, more to the military than the service members. It's a, it's a network of people working together to get a job done. Uh, for Just for the simple fact of me deploying, she has to take care of the household. She has to take care of our daughter. For when, I'm, when I can't help support her, she has to support us. Altogether, the massive art project is 290 feet wide and 22 feet high. It's part of a global art endeavor known as the Inside Out Project. A French street artist known as JR started that Inside Out Project. Through photos on huge canvases, he wants participants worldwide to stand up for what they care about, to turn the world inside out. I want to give back to my community. I was born and raised here. Um, I was raised less than a mile from the main gate of the naval base in Norfolk. My father was part of the greatest generation and served as a lieutenant commander in the South Pacific during World War II. Giving back to his community by acknowledging in a very public way the service of those on the front lines and here at home. Mark Martin, CBN News, Virginia Beach. That is a wonderful story. If you know a military family, please honor their service. The families are serving too. If you have a spouse, if you have a parent, if you have a child in active duty military, well, then you're sacrificing too, uh, particularly the children that, you know, the long deployments, uh, the multiple deployments that we've seen in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, we, we need to lift them up. We need to come alongside them and recognize their courage and their service. Critical race theory, transgender policies, sexually explicit material in libraries, and then mask mandates. These are hot button issues that have unleashed a national parents' right, rights movement spurred on by the recent Virginia election. So is it helping to lower the temperature at potentially volatile school board meetings? Well, Senior National Affairs Correspondent Heather Sells reports. I think people are feeling out of control. School board member Colleen Leary is well aware of the tension in her community of Chesapeake, Virginia. She says while many more parents are attending board meetings, they're usually respectful, yet very passionate. I pray before the meetings. Um, you know, because the flesh part of me sometimes wants to go, oh, you know. But then I have to remember that these children are their most valuable possession. They love their kids and they want what's best for their kids. In the Virginia election, parents concerned about education demonstrated their political power, with one quarter of the voters calling critical race theory their top issue. More than two-thirds of them voted for Glenn Youngkin. Virginia public schools are out of control. Political action committees like the American Principles Project helped feed that momentum, with more than six million watching their online ads. 
And it's not just Virginia. The 1776 PAC backed conservative school board candidates in seven states and won three-fourths of its targeted races. We started with just two chapters here in Florida. The parents' rights organization Moms for Liberty started in January and already has 60,000 members and 152 chapters spread across 33 states. It all points to an emerging movement that radio host Eric Erickson describes as organic and bipartisan. But if you look at the demographics and the polling on this, there are a lot of liberal parents as well who are deeply concerned about school closures, mask mandates for children. Leary and fellow board member Harry Murphy see this growth of parental involvement as a positive step. Quite honestly, I think it's great. They want to know what's happening. Whatever side they fall down on, they want to know what's going on in the schools. But some meetings across the country are getting out of hand, leading the attorney general to ask the FBI to get involved. Murphy sees it as inappropriate. I think that was strictly a political move. Pastor Sam Rodriguez, a former Trump faith advisor, believes it's dangerous political targeting. I see the actions of General Merrick Garland, the Department of Justice, as an egregious act um, exhibiting totalitarian, authoritarian uh, inclinations that more look like, smell like the vestiges of communist Russia, the Soviet Union and what the Chinese Communist government implements today. National security expert Dr. Paul Miller, who has worked for both the Bush and Obama administrations, says it's appropriate to investigate threats. To be very clear, threatening violence is, an act of, is, is a threat of terrorism when you're threatening to, to attack people over a difference of public policy. Um, and so, yes, law enforcement has a role to play here, whether it's state or federal, uh, depends upon which statute we're talking about. Why are you doing this? He and other national security experts are closely watching for domestic extremism. There's just a lot of agitation and a lot of frustration uh, out there, and people are feeling uh, greater permission to act outside the bounds of what we used to consider normal political activity. Polls like this from the American Enterprise Institute show that close to three in 10 Americans support political violence in certain circumstances. I will not sit down, I will comply. You Security experts express concern that extremists may try to recruit those with legitimate grievances, like parents, and they want to prevent the potential for more political violence, such as the 2017 congressional baseball shooting, pipe bombs mailed to members of Congress in January 6th. Could there be violence at state capitals? Could there be violence at polling booths at the next elections? Could there be violence at campaign events over the next year? I think those are all possibilities, uh, and you can't protect them all. And so that makes me very worried that we may see some of this stuff. For now, Erickson thinks the Biden administration might soften its stance on schools following Youngkin's win and the role of education in the race. I very much think they're going to have to back this down. It's not a bad, it's not a good look for the administration to say they're targeting parents. Such a move could also help tamp down some of the more heated school board meetings and perhaps encourage the political empowerment many parents are beginning to pursue. For Leary and Murphy, the way forward includes getting students back to their normal routines finding more ways to come together. We're gonna have to find some way where we just understand that there are things now beyond our control sometimes that we're just gonna have to deal with. And they may not be fun, they may not be easy, um, but we're gonna have to deal with them. And the, if we do deal with them in a, in a united way, then it's only gonna be better for our kids, our teachers, our school boards. Heather Sells, CBN News. Well, that was definitely a voice of reason in the middle of the turmoil, but I'm very concerned about how the federal government is being weaponized against the citizens who are protesting. And you have a legitimate right, you have a constitutional right to petition your government for a redress of grievances. And along with that, you have the right of free speech and you have the right of assembly. And for a government to then come in and say, well, we're going to investigate you. We're going to unleash the FBI and create profiles and track you and monitor you uh, because we're afraid of, quote, domestic terrorism, close quote. 
That's weaponizing the Justice Department. It's weaponizing the FBI against your own citizens. It should not happen in a free and open culture. It should not happen in a democracy. But it's not the first time this has happened. Just go back 10 years ago, Lois Lerner at the IRS was gravely concerned about the rising Tea Party and what that would do to the 2012 election. So she decided she had consultations in the White House. We have yet to find out what exactly was discussed. But it's clear from the logs that she was in the White House and in the Oval Office. So why is she in there during a political season? But what she did is she d disenfranchised the Tea Party. She said, well, we're not going to give you IRS letters so that you can collect donations tax free. Well, this is a whole nother level up. And it's not just the federal government. When the governors of California, when the governor of Kentucky says to the state police, write down every license plate in the parking lot of a church. Uh, that is unacceptable. We are not a surveillance state. We are not a police state. We are a government of we the people. We get to decide who our leaders are. We get to decide what our policies are. And whether that's at a school board or in Congress or in the administration, you have to listen to the people. Jumping out of airplanes, battling on the ground. Brad Munn knew exactly what he wanted to do with his life. For years, he tried to find his identity as a member of the United States military. So what did he find instead? Take a look. The smells, the taste, you're listening to your guys, and everybody's trying to be a little jovial but serious at the same time. Everybody knows this might be that day. Everybody knows. Army Staff Sergeant Brad Munn remembers when that day came for a good friend of his. It was April 26, 2006. Both were serving in Iraq when Brad got word his buddy had been killed by an IED while on a supply run. I did go to God, I sure did, shaking my fist, saying he's a good guy. Why him, why'd you do that? Ever since he was a young boy growing up in Florence, South Carolina, Brad had one thought in mind, join the military. I think it was the structure, the uniformity. I loved America, and I was like, you know, I need to do my part. Those dreams led him to military school in eighth grade, where he made a commitment to Christ. By the time he graduated in 1989, however, he discovered the party life, and his faith had faded. I was a fence rider. I wanted the best of both worlds. Did I walk away? Yeah, I did. Um, did he leave me alone? No. That summer, he enlisted in the Army, his sights set on joining the rank of the elite. They said, what do you want to do? I was like, I want airborne, I want infantry, and I want to go now. Why I became an infantryman, be able to jump out of planes, wearing the jump wings. I liked the badges and, you know, maroon beret and being 82nd airborne. It also became his identity, yet, even as he relished in his position and status, something was missing. On the outside, it appeared everything was going fine, and that's the way it was. I didn't let people in too, too far. No, I was miserable. Uh, there was no satisfaction in my life. So, after Brad received an honorable discharge four years later, he was lost. Bouncing between a couple law enforcement jobs and a stint in the Coast Guard, he went through multiple marriages that resulted in two children. Brad was also in and out of the church thinking, you know, that's going to bring some peace. It's going to calm me down. I'll have to make changes then. But I never did because I was trying to find my identity in other things. Brad says that wasn't the only reason for keeping God distant. I couldn't fight him away. I wanted to, and I tried to. I wrestled with him often. I couldn't let him win because if he won, then that means I would have to surrender. No, I don't surrender. So, in 2005, Brad re-enlisted, hoping to regain his identity. Promoted to staff sergeant, he was stationed in Iraq, where the constant threat of death gave him cause to reconsider his faith in God. Whenever I got off shift, if you will, I would go up on the top of the roof. I was like, all right, God, I don't know what you have planned. I don't. Um, my plan's not doing too good. I'm, I, I, I know I signed up to be over here. I got it, but I'm not getting it. His foxhole faith 
was quickly shattered when an IED killed a good friend in April 2006, and Brad blamed God. Why do you say you're such a good God? You're not such a good God for doing that. A month later, Brad was sent back to the U.S. where he was medically discharged for an old injury and PTSD. And for the next 10 years, he drank constantly, moving from one location to the next, trying and failing at college. Then, after a near-fatal motorcycle accident that left him in a coma and with a long recovery, he started going to church. I asked God some real questions, the doubting questions, show me something. And, you know, he would let me know, hey, man, I'm here. I got you. Even then, he still couldn't let God into his life and heart. Then, finally in January of 2015, something inside him broke. This particular day, there was something that was stirring inside of me, and I could not shake it. I was literally brought to my knees, overwhelmed, and I, I said, God, please help me here. I don't know. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Me, 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 I, I, I. And he said, Brad, it's not about you. It's all about me. And I threw my arms up, and I said, all right, I give it all to you. It's yours. I can't do this. I could breathe. I was truly free. He allowed me to see that relationship that I'd truly been yearning for this whole time. I was trying to find him people, places, persons, all these other things. Whenever he was like, I'm, I'm that relationship you've been looking for. Brad was finally able to finish his college degree, and then he graduated from seminary. Today, he's married to Dawn and pastors a church in rural South Carolina. To anyone who has felt that there's just no way out, been there, you locked yourself into this little world, you won't let anybody in, he's still there. And he's still there for you. Let that same revelation be your revelation today. It's not about what you do. It's about what he has already done and about how he can do these wonderful things for you if you only let him. Our, our innermost being, for whatever reason, this is worldwide, we, we somehow think that we've got to get right before we can come to God. Uh, this has been our way since the Garden of Eden, where uh, we're ashamed of what we've done and, and we try to hide from God. And, and God has that same question, uh, Adam, where are you? And he's asking that question of you. And he's not looking for information. He knows exactly where you are. But what he's asking for is, will you come out from your hiding place and look at him face to face and realize he is your savior. You don't have the ability to save yourself. You cannot clean yourself up. You can't change your behavior. You can't get out of that prison that you've created. You can't get rid of your guilt and shame. You can't do any of that. But here's the great news. God wants to do it for you. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever ask or think. He's able to separate you from your sins as far as the east is from the west. He's able to give you righteousness, peace, and joy. He's able to do all of that. What is he waiting for? Same thing that Brad did. Okay, I surrender. It's not by my power that this is going to happen. It's by what you've already done. If you want this, bow your head with me. Let's pray a very simple prayer and let God do what he's already promised to do. Jesus. Say his name. Say it out loud. Jesus. I come to you, and Jesus, I need you. I need a Savior. I need you to take me out of this prison I've created. I I need you to change my heart. I need you to forgive me. I need you to make me new again. And Jesus, 
if you do this, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to let somebody know. So call us, 1-800-700-7000. When you call, I've got something for you. It's called A New Day. It's a CD teaching of what do you do now, how do Christians live the Christian life. If you don't have a CD player, that's okay. We can send it to you as a download, or you can stream it on our website. It's all free, no obli financial obligation at all. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Welcome to Washington for this CBN News Break. Trial continues today after dramatic moments in the case against Kyle Rittenhouse, the teen accused of shooting three people and killing two of them during protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin last year. Taking the stand in his own defense, Rittenhouse testified he went there to protect businesses from the protesters and that he shot the men in self-defense, sobbing and breaking down as he recounted the incident. Later, the judge chastised the prosecutor for attempting to discuss evidence he had barred from trial. The judge is considering the defense's request for a mistrial. Well, a major milestone for the YouVersion Bible app, 500 million people around the world have now installed it, making it the first faith-based app to reach half a billion. So far this year, approximately 64 billion Bible chapters have been read or listened to on the app. That's up 21% over last year and 56% from two years ago. The app has expanded to include 2,600 ver versions of the Bible text in more than 1,700 languages. The app was launched back in 2008 and includes Bible plans, verse of the day stories, scripture images, and the ability to highlight and share Bible verses with friends, and congrats to them. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Military homecomings, we see them celebrated on the news. Soldiers return from the combat zone to a hero's welcome of hugs and cheers. What we don't see is what happens next. Dr. Tiffany Tajiri is a veteran U.S. Air Force officer and a licensed and board certified clinical psychologist. She understands firsthand the loneliness and darkness that can be a part of a veteran's journey. My veterans have come up to me and said, Doc, where is God in war? She says many have a hard time adjusting to life back home and often lose their faith. In her book, Peace After Combat, Dr. Tajiri helps veterans and their loved ones who are dealing with the wounds of war to find spiritual and emotional healing so they can have a better future. Dr. Tiffany Tajiri is with us now via Skype. Welcome to the program today. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a blessing. Well, you, for many combat veterans, being at home can sometimes feel even more foreign than being overseas. How does that happen? The operational tempo of our veterans is incredible when they're overseas. And so when they finally slow down, everything that they saw while they were in combat starts to resurface. It's an intrusive memories, intrusive nightmares. And also they feel overstimulated by the environment at large. Multiple factors come into play here. Well, for families, I feel like they're so... Um stranded in this and not expecting it, what do the families of military members need to know when their loved one comes home? Well, to be patient, give them time. I know you want to smother them with hugs and kisses, and that's okay because I'm sure they're meditating in their own minds about that happening. But just be patient because they are adapting. Some have done this a myriad of times. Others, this is the first time. So there's always going to be a transition process wherein they can feel overstimulated. They may need time to be with their brother or sister at arms because they can relate to them. And also just to give them that space because they need to process, they need to go into prayer if that's what they need to do, if they are believers. They need to decompress from the high operational temple they experienced in combat and also to really truly process and digest what they may have seen that could have hurt their spirit. But doctor, do they even know how to begin to do that? Many veterans have seen the horrors of war, losing friends, maybe struggling with survivor guilt. Some might even blame themselves for those deaths. So 
What do you say in those situations and how do they begin the process? Well, I tell them the brain is just like the gut. It has to digest, right? The brain has to digest these incredible experiences, good, bad, and the ugly. And you have to make sense of it. You know, the hallmark trait of PTSD is avoidance. We don't want to deal with it. We don't want to process it. But what we have to do, and God has wired our brain in such an incredible way that it brings these intrusive memories to the forefront because we need to address them, these intrusive memories these traumatic experiences are toxic. They're poison. So we need to process and digest. And how do we do that? We take the trauma from the amygdala, which is the fear center of the brain, and we bring it to the frontal lobe. We dissect it, right? We look at it from multiple angles. We recognize that God is not the author of our pain and suffering, but he is the one who makes a way through the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And when we're able to see the blessing in the midst of the hurt and the pain, we actually deconstruct the trauma memory all the way down to the physical substrates, the proteins, the DNA, and it doesn't file back into the fear center of the brain in the amygdala. It actually just goes back to the hippocampus, which is the regular long-term memory. But the most important thing when it comes to healing is letting our service member know that God is on your side. God neurobiologically wired you to love and to be loved. You were created and designed for love and relationship. And in order to have love, you have to have relationship. And in order to have relationship, you have to have free will. God's never going to take away your free will, right? It's the way he created you in his image that we can do things and think and act with consequences. And so when bad things happen, we recognize maybe because of somebody other, some other person's free will that was negative. And it's not God operating on that end, but what he will do is he will turn beauty for ashes. He didn't create us to be robots or to be automatons. He gave us that free will, but when we misuse it, he continues to help us to thrive. He gives us grace. He gives us forgiveness, right? And then he also gives us the opportunity to have that divine well, restoration. Yeah, you've developed a process called rhythm restoration. What's that? So rhythm helps regulate the autonomic nervous system. It helps to calm you. You know, if I look out at my waiting room, I see a hundred legs bobbing up and down. Everybody's nervous. So it helps to calm you. First thing you ever heard in your mother's womb was her heartbeat, right? Um, you were developed to a rhythm. In scripture, it says, walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it, learn my unforced rhythms. Rhythms are so important of grace, right? So the second part is bilateral stimulation. And my soldiers love bilateral stimulation. They don't know how it, they're using it on a regular basis when they go on a ruck, a march or a walk. That's bilateral stimulation. You're triggering both hemispheres of your brain in that movement, right? Simply doing this is bilateral stimulation. We do it organically in REM sleep, but then we add the component of visualization. Now, what's interesting is there's a difference between the mind versus the brain. Now, the mind is the intelligent part and the brain is the globular goop in your head and the mind determines how the brain is going to be wired. So uh, the brain doesn't know the difference between a real and an imagined experience. So I have them visualize God in the midst of their painful experiences. And when they see God acting on their behalf, going before them, yea, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he is with me. When they see the beautiful camaraderie, the love, the miracles in the midst of combat, they're changing their memories. And that's using the power of their visualization. I always think of the imagination as God's projector, what he wants us to see, because he asks us, I can do more than you could ever imagine, guess a request in your wildest dreams. And I have people visualize the Ephesians 3.20 life and also to look back at the past simply by tapping and closing their eyes where God is and how God is working in their favor. I want to say that your book is called Peace After Combat, Healing the Spiritual and Psychological Wounds of War. Her book is available nationwide. Dr. Tajiri, thank you for the work you're doing. So important and so wonderful that you're able to help find freedom for so many. God bless you. Well, when a 7.1 earthquake tore through Anchorage, Alaska, Desiree was terrified. She and her husband were unharmed, but their home was badly damaged. Suddenly, this retired military couple faced a financial nightmare. Not for long. Thanks to people like you who support CBN's Helping the Homefront. After 28 years of military service, U.S. Coast Guard veteran Terrence and his wife Desiree are enjoying retirement in Alaska. During his career, Terrence deployed multiple times, confident leaving the household in Desiree's capable hands. She took care of everything. She is my rock. 
She is my support system. Although the challenges of military separations are behind them, the couple faced one of their biggest trials ever when a 7.1 earthquake struck Anchorage. The epicenter registered less than 10 miles from their home. I dropped to my knees and I held onto the side of the bed. Everything fell over that could fall over in every room, in every closet. I was terrified. Their home sustained major damage both inside and out. We had a lot of cracks in our drywall. We got doors that won't close. The floor downstairs is off tilted. The driveway is tore up and it messed up our garage. There's a lot of damage. The repairs totaled $15,000. Because they didn't have earthquake insurance, the couple faced a financial nightmare. It's frustrating that I have to tap into our retirement to get this home in the original state that it was in. It's very upsetting. Despite these overwhelming circumstances, the couple relied on their faith to get through. Whatever needed I put before the Lord, he's going to see us through it. Yes. Their prayers were answered when New Season Church contacted Helping the Home Front. Pastor Tommy Leonard shared the big news. Helping the Home Front wants to take care of all of the contracting costs for your house being repaired. I wasn't expecting to hear that. So there's more. CBN is also going to also take care of all the finishing work. They're going to pay for all the painting. And so we're going to go down to Home Depot today in order for you to pick out all the paint colors that you desire, that everything can be done and complete and made whole oh, again. Wow, I can't believe that. Yeah. You know, you see this with, happening with other people. <laughs> you never, you, you know, never, you. never would think that it would be you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. A contractor began the repairs right away as the couple headed to Home Depot to pick out their paint. Their home is now completely restored. I will be forever grateful to CBN for what they're doing and what they do for not just the military but others outside of the military as well because they do a great deal and it's really appreciated. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're doing that. You're helping that wonderful family. You're helping active duty military families. You're helping families across America who have uh, food needs. We're, we're delivering millions of pounds of food every, every single year. You're a part of that. You're a part of disaster relief. You're a part of the livelihood programs. You're a part of Orphan's Promise. You're a part of Superbook. You're a part of this broadcast. You're a part of all of it when you join the 700 Club. If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. How do you do that? Well, you just pick up a phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is it? It's $20 a month, 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold for you at $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year. That's $84 a month. Now, when you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. Bank doing all the work, and we can send as our gift to you Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So if you'd like those, ask for Pledge Express when you call or go to CBN.com. You can even text us, CBN to 71777. We leave you today with these words from James. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.